Your Locked On Wild, your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. New intro? Oh yeah, you better believe it. Welcome to another Locked On Wild Live here on a uh, very nice Sunday, Masters Sunday here uh, after a 6-2 to two win for the Minnesota Wild last night over the uh, San Jose Sharks. A late postcast, uh, and so we're just going to hang out and uh, we'll take your questions here uh, throughout the uh, course of the hour. I'm going to do a little game of stay or go for the roster, but uh, we'll give people a little time to fuel uh to funnel in and uh then we'll get things going what up what's up ron getting us started with get the f out for the uh, general manager and president william garen we'll talk more about that um later here today, but I uh, hope everybody's Sunday is off to a good start. Looking forward to just sitting on the couch and watching the Masters all day today. Actually, going to do combo platter back to back Masters Timberwolves here on this uh, this wonderful Sunday. Seems like a pretty good plan of attack for uh, today. We are doing great out here, Jay. Just uh, just getting ready to. I'm gonna go get a run in once we're done here, and um, looking forward to looking forward to what should be a pretty uh, pretty good Sunday here. So let's take a look at the roster. Amanda joining us here today. Windows are wide open, getting some nice sunshine. I got to do the same. My patio door directly to my right. You got to pop that open and uh, get some fresh air up in this piece. Um, let's look at the roster. And I'm just going to go through my initial sweep of uh, stay or go. And feel free to comment and uh, agree or disagree. I'll go with what we have on the roster currently. So Kaprizov, Eriksson, Ek, Boldy as your top line. Those three players, you're not you're not going to move those guys. I would say the uh, likelihood on a scale of one to ten, the likelihood that any of the three of them get moved is a zero. So top line, that's that's what you would go to war with starting next season. Um, assuming nothing changes between now and then. Second line, Marcus Johansson has got to be, has got to be any players that could be in a better spot than Johansson. There has to be any number. And honestly, so... Matt Zuccarello will occupy one of those spots on that second line next year. Marco Rossi will occupy the center spot on that second line. Again, assuming nothing changes, you have to upgrade that second line wing spot. And honestly, if we're doing a hierarchy of who should go this off season, it is like Alex Goligoski will be gone. He's going to retire. So that takes care of that. Of the contracts, I think you just are in a position in which, like, I, I think you just have to move on from Marcus Johansson. And <clears throat> I think you got to find, I think you got to find a taker for Freddie. I think those two I think those two contracts just have to be have to be moved. Because we've seen Murat who's in a Dinoff hold his own. So that third line center spot is his next season. And 
honestly, like I I think that order for centers, I think that's about at, at least right now, uh, unless who's Nadinov takes a big jump in his rookie season next year, like his first full season. If he takes a jump and then maybe at that point you, you flip those two, but Eric Sinek is your one, Rossi is your two, and who's Nadinov as your three. I, I feel pretty good about that as your, uh, your centers for this organization going forward. They, they bring some real, they, they all bring a little something different to the table, but as we'll talk about when we get to Marco Rossi for um, his season eval, like the big key for him is going to be to just kind of expand his, his range. Like he's really good at getting to the net. He, he has learned that as his default setting, which is fantastic. But now if he can start to, you know, if he can start to gain some shot mobility, which we saw, um, his most recent goal was a sweet one-timer from the uh, the right face-off circle. That was fantastic. Um, if he can start to do that a little more consistently, that's where he that's where he's going to make his jump next season. So if he does that, even a little bit, he's he's locked in as your two C. Murat, who's Nadinov, has the defensive side pretty well down. He brings great speed. And he is starting to, um, he's starting to get that default setting of going to the net. Like all, all the centers, all the centers should just, and they're they're starting to pick this up. Just default to the net and build out from there. So, um, that is that's kind of what I would like to see from those guys. <coughs> As we go, and as as the fourth line center goes, as far as as far as that spot, that's an interesting one because I feel like if because Swiffer T Wet Jet Mop brings up a good point, I feel like no one would trade for Freddie because of the term on his deal. Best chance to move on from him would probably be a buyout. And I think what Bill Guerin is going to do is he's going to err on the side of patience. And so what you probably do then is you probably slot Freddie in as your fourth center. He just, he tries like, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get on him the same way we do Marcus Johansson. He tries out there. He just is very limited in what he brings to the table. And so fourth line center with Mason Shaw on one side and somebody else on the other, that's that's probably okay. But honestly, I would just I would rather at this point just free up that spot because th there's too much. And I'm gonna do like I'm gonna do a once the season is done after the uh, the Kraken game. We're going to do a spin on the State of the Union. It won't be political, obviously. But we're going to do a state of the state of hockey. And a place, a theme in which I would like to see this team move on from is just having guys that exist. Don't really bring you a ton. Like, I would just like to see... I, th I think we would feel way different about how this team is going forward if you just had guys that brought something at pretty much every spot in the lineup, especially in the offensive side, even just a little bit of upside. If you had guys that brought promise and intrigue, I think we would feel immensely different about where this thing is at. So let's just... Let's just say for argument's sake, Eric Sinek, Rossi, who's Nadinov, and Goudreau. That's your that's your center depth um for next season. 
Kaprizov and Boldy, they'll be the wings on the top line. And this is interesting because second line, you've got Zuccarello in one spot. And honestly, I'd be all for having Liam Ugrin get an opportunity to be that other wing. He's he's a big body, but he's got good instincts and he makes quick decisions. Quick decisions is such a it feels like it's such a basic thing, but we've seen it play out all season is just how much of a difference it makes with guys on this roster. Just quick decisions. That's one of the things I like most about what Declan Chisholm brings to the table is he doesn't just sit with the puck, especially when he's on the power play. He doesn't just sit with the puck. Like if he gets it from somebody, if he gets it from Zuccarello or if he gets it from or whoever, he maybe hangs on to it for a second, but he's making a quick play to try to keep that thing moving because he gets it. He gets it. You get if you get stagnant, you die as as a team in the NHL. If you get stagnant and you um and you just are are not moving, that's when the problems arise. And so that's one of the things that I've liked about Ugarin in his first two games is that he makes quick decisions. And who's Nadinov has shown a good amount of that. These guys make quick decisions. They get rid of the puck quickly. They're not just sitting on it, just waiting forever to make plays. It's it's a small ask, but it makes a big difference. So I would I would like to see that next year. Zuccarello, Rossi, Ugrin uh, as your second line. And then, then you, then you've got Felino, you've got Hartman, and you've got Johansson. See, this is, this is again, this is again why I would just like to have those roster spots freed up because. If you go, um, if you go Felino on the third line on one of those wing spots, I'd prefer the other be Hartman because Hartman at least brings the ability to shoot. I just, I just don't think, I just don't think Marcus Johansson brings you anything you can't get from somebody else. So we're going to call it right now. We're going to call this number one priority for Locked on Wild this offseason is to move on from 90. 90 has got to go. That is the official now mission statement. You can buy them out for next to nothing. You'll save $1.2 million this upcoming season if you buy them out. And then you end up having an additional 660k on your books for the following season. I would have done that I would have done that 6 weeks ago, honestly, if I had the choice. That's just easy math. That is very palatable and it feels like whoever you put in that spot, whether it be Ugrin or whoever Whoever you put in that spot, it feels like we are next season going to say, boy, isn't it fun to have a second line that can keep up? So that's that's the objective. That's that's the goal. That's that's what I think we should strive for for next season. And so I think I think we've got a consensus that Hartman, Felino, and who's Nadinoff, we like that as a third line. I think we got a good consensus. Um, and then your fourth line, it, it seems pretty likely at this point that Mason Shaw is going to get re-signed to stay. And look, he's a vibes guy. He plays physical. I don't, I don't have an issue with that. Freddie is the four C. And then you probably go, um, 
You probably go Letary as your other fourth line guy. Offensively. At least Ugrin at about average NHL size seems willing to be physical and stand up to guys. Modeling his game after Landeskog seems great for this team. <sighs> if, if he could be even if he could be even 70% of um what Landeskog brings to the table, that's a huge win. And then you go and you circle back to the Fiala trade. And now that's a clear cut win. If Ugrin can even give you a percentage of what Landeskog brings to the table, that's a huge win. You have you have fleeced the Los Angeles Kings in that trade. Um, it's been a it's been a fun first couple of games for Liam for sure, and I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that. This is a great opportunity for him to build. And the, the best part about this, the best part about getting Uger in the opportunity here this season is that now he's going to have the entire offseason to train, get himself in position to make the team. He wants to make the team next year out of camp. I would love nothing more than for that to happen. Shaw, Freddie, and JoJo as your uh, fourth line. At least Freddie is a right shot center. And I I think like if we if we have one of the two if we keep one or the other I would keep Freddie for the fact that at least he is a center. Like and again, I just I just don't really get what you're getting, especially because as Amanda notes, like Johansson has spent pretty much the entire season in that second line, that second line spot. He brings speed. He can enter the zone relatively effectively once in a while. That's all well and good. But like at the end of the day, if you don't shoot the puck, you don't score. <sighs> Again, I, I think whoever they put there, I think you're going to see a notable bump. Um, and you're going to see much better production from that second line. Did we try JoJo and Boldy this year? They had such good chemistry at first. Uh, they they did try that for a, a few games, and it just it was the same thing. Like Boldy was doing all the work, and um, Johansson just was. Is just in passenger mode. Um, Johansson does bring crispy figure eights. If Yurov comes over, does that change the lineup? Do they try him at center and move who's Nadine off to the wing? This is also very interesting because if Danila Yurov is ready to play, you're not like you're not gonna you're not gonna put him in Iowa. And just let him do his, like, you're not going to leave the bun in the oven. Like, how many How many of you have a, oh, no, we burnt the buns for Thanksgiving story? It seems like a regular occurrence at my house. You burn the bottom of the buns. Like, you don't need to overthink it with Yurov. If Yurov is not going to go back to the KHL, then he needs to be on the NHL roster. And in that case, then, in that case, oh boy. This, oh. This is a this is a tricky. This is a tricky one. I suppose what I would do is at least to start the season, still probably do Kaprizov, Erickson Ek, Boldy, but then I would probably do Zuccarello, Rossi, Yurov. And then you go Ugrin, who's Nadinov, and Felino. And then probably Hartman, Shaw, Goudreau. 
would probably be how I would do that. I don't know. That's that's a that's a good one to it's a good one to mull over here um over the off season. Could be wrong, but I see Yurov with one more year in Russia. He just started learning center. It might be best to let him continue to learn that role for another season. And the other part of this, too, is that he's going to make, he would make loads more money going to the uh, the KHL for another year than he would going to Iowa. And then signing his ELC at the end of the season, maybe burning a year to get up to the NHL level for the final few games next year. That would be a possibility, but that's probably the most likely route. And then at that point, you have a few more roster spots that have freed up because let's just look at this right now. So Adam Beckman, Adam Beckman is a restricted free agent after this season. I think at this point, it's pretty it's pretty high odds that he's not back. Um, Jake Lucchini is an unrestricted free agent. Kind of a, a 4A guy similar to Kyle Rao from the uh, the last few years. So he could be an Iowa depth piece that you re-sign. Mason Shaw is a restricted free agent. Again, I feel like it's pretty likely he's back. But then after 2024-2025... Whether you've moved on from Marcus Johansson after this season or not, his contract is off the books. You will be giving Murat Huznadinov an extension by that point. Uh, Vinny Letary will be an unrestricted free agent. And, you know, I, I do feel like, to kind of circle back, to Ron's comment here. Jesse suggested that one of the three between Felino, Zuccarello, or Hartman should be moved. I don't disagree, but which one do you move? Because on the Marcus Felino, on the Marcus Felino route, you know, he played 56 games this year. Is somebody going to want to take that deal on? Unless he can show that, and it's the year before that, he played 73, I think, which is better. But a guy may, a guy playing 55 games, that's that's a risk. Hartman is pretty durable, but he's also at this point, he's also your, I think, fifth leading scorer this season. So, and then Zuccarello is, is up there too. Like it's, it's a tough call because if you do get rid of one of those guys, you are moving on from an area. You are further subtracting from what has been a massive, um, massive issue for this team. Yeah, Ryan Hartman, at least from a points perspective, is your sixth, um, your sixth leading scorer. Matt Zuccarello is your fourth leading scorer. From a goals perspective, Ryan Hartman is fifth on the team. I imagine they make a trade next summer to acquire another top four D man or a center. If they have a surplus of good young forwards, they probably create a package, which gets the wild, a quality vet. And especially, especially if you're continuing to operate under trying to be competitive while Kirill Kaprizov is here, then that, that tracks with the approach. Um, it's just I'm going to I'm going to continue to harp on it. I just wish I would just have just waited. Like we could be having we could be having the conversation after the end of this after this season is done as to who stays or goes 
from an extension standpoint. But now you got them all here. And so I would say of the guys, I would say of the guys that you look to deal, it's probably, uh, I don't know. I mean, Dougie says might, Zuccarello might be easiest to move and could possibly go to the Rangers. They like him there and he could finish his career with the team. Yeah, that would be that would probably be a route, but you have given you've given too much power to the players to where they can for the most part they can say yes or no. That's also if they don't get a guy like Brock Nelson as a UFA, which you could you just need cap space to acquire. And that's that's another route too is is and th- this is like this is the Avs method or the stars method is they got all the pieces up at the top locked in. And so then they just supplement with your Jake Gensel's or your Brock Nelson's and they just slot them in as third line or second line guys and you're free rolling, but they're just something is going to have to be done. I mean, I'm just looking at the numbers right now, and from a plus-minus perspective, your three worst, two of your three worst players from a mi- plus-minus perspective, Freddie Goudreau is a minus 21 in 65 games. Marcus Johansson's a minus 14 in 76 games. I. I think at best, I think at best you come back with one of those guys and that would most likely be Goudreau as a fourth line guy. You can't put, I don't think you can put any stock into either of those guys playing anywhere above the fourth line. Thirty points in seventy-six games, playing sixteen minutes a night. <sighs> uh, of the things that I thought I would be worrying about this season. Oh well. Yeah, and if you go the route of Shaw and Goudreau and um maybe Hartman cuz uh, here's another name Riley Heights he could get a nine game look as well there are a lot of spots there are a lot of spots that could be filled with younger options that might might catch fire might latch onto a job and never give it up so it does feel like there's going to have to be something done in the off season, like to move, to free up spots, to move one or two to shake things up because it, the reason I keep, the reason I keep harping on the shake things up, um, line of thinking is if your goal is to be a playoff team every season, you can't justify bringing this back as is constructed. You have to do something to, because um, one of the big issues for this team, too, is there just was a lack of urgency for most of the year. So many, so many games in which, and I'll, I'll never forget that Marco Rossi quote after game like 66, in which he said it just didn't feel like a few guys on the team were were ready to go. Why are we having that conversation in game 66 of the season? That should be like a game five problem. Not a game 66. How many points would Erickson Eck have if he didn't have to play with Johansson for part of the year at even strength? He'd probably be in the 70s, which would be a seven point bump. Um, 63 points in 75 games for Jewel Erickson Eck. 
And I can't wait to do his player card because um, his numbers this year again, like he just ever. Just improves every every season. Um, 30, 30 goals this year. That's a career high. The 33 assists is five fewer than his best, which was last year. But his 63 points is a career high. His plus minus of 18 is a career high. His power play goals of 12 tied a career high like every 20 30, 20 minutes 32 seconds of ice time a night that's a career high i bet if i go look at his face offs i bet if i go look at his uh face offs that is at or around a career high um let's and it's just yeah, 49.7%. Jules Eriksson Ek with a career high in terms of uh, face-off percentage. 53 blocks is two off of his career high. 167 hits is a career high by a long shot. Uh, Jules Eriksson Ek is a touch below 50% on the face-off dot in a career high in attempts by a mile. Like, I, I, know, we, I know we've had... Um, I know we've had conversations and gripes about some of the things that John Hines has done, but making Jewel Erickson Eck his version of what Freddie Goudreau was for Dean Evison, um, very, very smart choice. <laughs> very good call. Very good call on Hines part. Um, like just it, dude is just a monster. How do we consistently have no guys who can win over half of their face-offs? I'm going to do a full dive into face-offs this offseason because there's so much that goes into, um, into face-offs. There's so much that goes into it, like reflex, uh, positioning, um, like if the, the guy across from you is trying to, to push you out of the way as opposed to going for the puck. Like there are a bunch of things. And yet it has always been something that the Minnesota wild just are routinely near the bottom of the list from a face offs perspective. And would it shock you to learn that let's just see who is amongst the regulars. Let's see who is second in terms of face off percentage. Uh, Freddie Goudreau is actually first on the team, but he's only taken he's only taken like 500. Jewel Erickson Eck has taken 1,500 faceoffs this year. Um, like Ryan Hartman, 47 percent. Uh, Marco Rossi, 44 and a half percent. Like it's just it's such a weird art. Um that it it warrants a very big dive into it. Jewel Erickson Eck is severely underpaid. He is performing at about a um, eight or a nine million dollar per year player. And he's making five points. Like analytically, he's performing at about an eight million dollar per year level. So he's providing you a ton of a ton of value there. Matt Boldy as a seven million per year guy. I think last I checked, he is providing you, he is performing at about a seven or he's performing at like a seven and a half or eight million per year player. That is how the wilds um that's how they take advantage of the lean cap years by having guys exceed what they're getting paid to do. Like Ryan Hartman two years ago was paid like $1.2 million, 35 goals. Massive amount of value returned on investment. 
Marcus Johansson, by the way, faceoff percentage is 18.8%. He has uh, six wins, 26 losses on the season. And that's the other, like, that's the other thing. Um, that's the other part about faceoffs is sometimes you get all set to take one and you jump and you get bumped off the, off the dot or your opponent gets bumped off the dot. There's a lot of variables that go with winning faceoffs. Um, Jojo needs to go. I, I, I think we, I think we are in unison on this, that, uh, that that roster spot needs to be freed up for some other thing. Now let's talk defense too. As we talked about the offense, I feel like we're in pretty good. I feel like we're in pretty good unison as to what should be done about this offense. Uh, defensively. Biggest question mark on defense is the captain, Jared Spurgeon. Now, where he's at in this process is anybody's guess. He had the surgeries, both of them. Um, he is expected to be ready for the start of the 2024-2025 season. He's expected to be ready for training camp, at least according to Daily Faceoff. Um, but like he's Spurgeon is 34. He's not getting any younger. The toll that a body takes is magnified the older you get. And Spurgeon has missed games here. He's missed games there. I am not confident at this point in just penciling him into the lineup. I think this is a part of the reason that we saw Zach Bogosian get re-signed is because you've got question marks about Jared Spurgeon. It is pretty apparent that the defensive prospects in Iowa, with the exception of Damon Hunt, it's pretty apparent that those guys aren't ready for NHL life uh, in really any sense of the game. So there, there, this is why this is why we've pointed to you should draft a defenseman. Um, to add to your mix because Spurgeon's getting older, Brodeen is getting older. You have Brock Faber who is going to slot into one of those top spots. Alex Goligoski is coming off the roster. You could make a case that it's time for a change of scenery for John Merrill. But I think with the fact that there are questions on Spurgeon and there are questions on most of the defensive prospects in the system right now, I, I don't think we're going to see John Merrill moved off the roster. Because you just at this point, with the injury history that Spurgeon and to a lesser extent Jonas Brodeen have, you've got to have you've got to have bodies. I would love to see Damon Hunt be one of the regulars next season. But if if John Merrill is not setting a high bar, if this team felt like Damon Hunt was ready for regular action, he would be here. Like John Merrill is not we've we've seen it play out all season and in respect to John Merrill, I think his play has been better over the last three weeks or so in full respect to John Merrill, because I have taken him to task quite a bit this season in full respect to him. His play has been better, but he's not setting a high bar. If Bill Guerin thought that Damon hunt was ready for full-time action, he would be here for whatever reason. He, I, I, I thought he looked good in the games that he played this year, but, if he was ready, he'd be here. So 
defensively, you've got a lot of questions because Middleton has been on the hook for a bunch of minuses this season. And, you know, Declan Chisholm, that was a savvy, that was a real savvy pick by Garen. He has room to improve defensively, I think. is I don't think that's saying anything out of line. He has room to improve defensively, but I just have been really impressed with what Chisholm does from an offensive standpoint. That um, I, I think, I think the Wild got a good one, and I hope that they keep him around for longer than just next season. And this is why there's been all the talk about acquiring somebody else to slot in because there are legitimate questions about the uh, the decor going forward. So. Middleton has shown a lot of warts when not paired with Faber or Brodeen. And um, I think I think because Middleton, while he is while he can be good defensively, I think because he kind of slots more into that physical realm, which is why if you have somebody that's adept defensively, you can um you can pair them with him to kind of take all of those defensive responsibilities when it's been Goligoski, when it's been Les Walls campaign for Middleton and um, Les Walls campaign for Middleton and Bogosian is a pairing next year during the broadcast last night. And I was like, I don't know. Drafting for needs seems like a mistake. If the best guy available is Nygaard or Catton, I think you take them and then trade for D-Man, who is 24-plus. The guy we draft likely won't play for three to four years anyway. And this is a good point. My, my line of thinking is just if one of those defenseman prospects drops, they fall to 12 or 11 or wherever the Wild end up drafting. If they fall... I would be perfectly fine with taking them. If they're not there, then yeah, you uh, you go with whoever is BPA at the time. Wild drafted for need in the first round last year. And while it is way too early to close the book on Charlie Strammel, um, it's, it's certainly not off to a great start. The Chikrin deal is interesting because he's been linked to the wild for quite some time but in my talking to the locked on senators guys and maybe maybe this is where you take an opportunity of a guy who needs a change of scenery the vibes are very bad with chikrin in ottawa right now very bad like he is he is not having a good year um and I don't know if that's just him kind of playing his way out, but that would be something that would be worth monitoring. And, you know, it could be a situation where you swoop in and you get him for a uh, lower price than it would have cost, say, for Ottawa to go get him. Because let's just... Let's just look at what... Chick where Chikrin is at. So he, he has one more year on his deal at 4.6. What has he done this year? So he's got um he's got 13 goals, 27 assists, so 40 points in 80 games. He is a minus 28. Last time the Wild were at 12 overall, they snagged one Matt Boldy. So certainly, certainly could work out in their favor um, again at that spot. If that's where they draft and I, I had to laugh. I don't know if you all saw the uh, Russo tweet today. 
basically how the draft lottery works is that the the top 11 in the draft have a chance for the first overall pick from 12 to the um end of the season for from 12 to the end of the lottery i think has a chance to move up but he said it's just fitting that the minnesota wild are sitting at 12 right now Maybe they, you know, if they lose, maybe they get to 11. Be nice, but um, we got two more games to see how that plays out. Yeah, it, it is mostly, Sean, due to the goalies. That goalie situation in Ottawa is cheeks. Um, Anton Forsberg and uh, Jonas Corposalo. Let's check in and see how they're doing this year. Uh, Corpus. Oh. 3.26 goals against average and an 890 save percentage for Corpus Solo. Forsberg is at a 330 with an 886. Oh. Yikes. Yeah, that's those are gross numbers. That's just real, real bad. So, okay, let's let's circle back to this um, as to how this is going to play out next year defensively. So here here would be here would be my prediction as to how. Oh, great, too far. As to how the. Um, pairings will look next year i'm just gonna just throw it out there i'm gonna put jared spurgeon on long-term injured reserve to start the season i i i still have legitimate doubts so i think you see probably middleton and faber again brodeen and I, th I think you see pretty close to what you currently have. Um, Middleton, Faber, Brodeen, Bogosian, Merrill Chisholm is probably at least what you're at to start the season unless there's a trade made to acquire somebody to slot Bogosian down to third pairing with Chisholm and uh, to get somebody to play in that top four. If Spurgeon does start the season on long-term injured reserve and you have that cap space available, probably, probably what you do. Yeah, it just, it becomes then, because here's, so here's the, here's the rub on the defensive front. So you've got Spurgeon locked in at seven point five seven million. You've got Brodeen locked in at six. Um, and now you're gonna lock Brock Faber in two. At what? Probably nine. Um. You've got I just it feels like you've got to free up some money to add to your forward group. Otherwise, you are going to what are we at right now? You're at 14.9 million on defense this year. You'll be at um you'll be probably in a similar spot next year, but then um, well, no, that's with, that's with bro or, uh, Spurgeon on long-term injury reserve. So that would be, that'd be 22 million this year for defense. Um, next year it'll be similar. And then after that, you've got 13.5 plus, let's just say eight, You'd be at 22 and a half for four guys. Then you've got um, Middleton, 
will be an unrestricted free agent at that point. Declan Chisholm's deal, let's say he gets around two. Um, now you're up to 24. And all of this, like, all this pulls money away from your forward group, which is where I think it should be going. What happens with the cap if Spurgeon doesn't play again? Can he retire outside of the uh, ends? It, basically, what would happen is um, he'd go on long-term injured reserve, and then you would have a situation where you could trade the contract um, to get the money off the books. I, If he retires, I don't know what. I don't know what the penalty would be if he retires early, if it's a cap recapture situation. Um, oh, buyout current contract. Let's see what this looks like. Oh. No, you can't buy that deal out. Oh, boy, that's... <sighs> Yeah, you can't buy that deal out. Holy cow. Oh, I'm. I'll have to look into this because I don't know what the stipulation is if he retires. I don't know if the wild get bit in the ass for it. Um, like with Parisian suitor. Basically, the most likely situation at this point is that his contract just becomes a long-term injured reserve uh, trade chip. He was young enough at contract signing that I'm pretty sure his cap hit would just go away. Well, if that's how that plays, if that's um, if that's how that pl if that's how that plays no questions asked then long-term injured reserve him until he is ready to ready to hang it up because what was it 16 games this year for spurge um he played 16 this year 79 last year uh, 65, 54, 62. And I know there were some shortened seasons in there, but his last 82 game season was 2018, 2019. And, um, I think the recapture was just for front loaded, super long contracts like Parisian Suter. They were only owed 10 million in each each in real money with four years left in their deals. That makes sense. That tracks. Uh, thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, I was actually not following the NHL at the time that um, those deals were signed. Still, it just, it just boggles my mind um, that that got thrown in, but Let him roast on long-term injured reserve till he's fully healed and then retire. I, I've, I just, it's just a tough, it's just a tough road to come back from. So we'll just, it, it's, it's a big question that is going to need to be figured out um, because like you, you can't, guys got to play. Guys have to play to have value. If they're sitting on, if they're sitting on the bench, if they're on long-term injured reserve, they're not helping you out other than the cap relief, which the wild didn't really use at all. Other than to bring players up this past season. Anyway, it is a business. We forget. I think, I think this fact has been, um, I think this fact has been missed a little bit by this team. Um, is that like at the end of the day, it is a business 
and business decisions need to be made. As far as the goalie situation goes, we talked about it at length last night, but it's entirely dependent on what Flurry does. If Flurry decides to come back, then you got to make a call. And I think you're hurting Jesper by throwing him down in Iowa with a a real young team. Um, I, I just I don't think that does anything for him development wise. So then you have one half of the goalie situation figured out if Jesper's up here and if Flurry's coming back then i think the uh i think the writing's kind of on the wall we got a lot that we got a lot of questions though that are going to be fully dove into over the entirety of the off season like there, there's just we we get the option to um we get the option to go down to three episodes a week during the off season. And as I sit here right now, there's too much to talk about. Like there's way too much going on. We got the draft. We got all these big questions. We've got, you know, there's just there's a lot going on. And so we, just because the season is done, just because the final two games of the season are on Monday and on Thursday, we're not going anywhere. Like, we got to get all this stuff sorted out. Like, there just is, there's too much going on to, um, to not go pedal to the metal. Now, I will say, there will probably be some times in which yours truly takes a little bit of a vacation. So we may have some stuff loaded in and then react to big news once I return. But we got a full off season of stuff to, uh, to go into. So that officially starts on monday the 22nd we're gonna do like a we're gonna do probably a full week um of just kind of recapping the season and i'm not gonna do what i did last year where i just do like exclusively player evals um we're, we're gonna mix things up like we'll do evals we'll do um, draft profiles. We'll just kind of keep things, keep things fresh here for the off season. But that, uh, I think is going to wrap it for today's locked on wild live. Thanks everybody for hanging out here on this, uh, wonderful Sunday. And let's end with a positive. Does anyone remember a time when the wild had a surplus of good forwards on the team in the system? It, it feels like the wild are on the cusp of having just a ton of like quality depth. And if we learned anything this year, it's that is needed. Um, like Liam Ogren, Murat, who's Nadinov. We haven't even seen Danilo Yurov yet. And there are like seven or eight guys beyond that, that are just going to be desperately needed injections of youth energy and like the only thing that we need to do is get them onto the roster so if we can just if we can just get get past that final step that final hurdle that last 20 yards of the marathon we're gonna be in a much better spot we'll get through it and uh again Lockdown Wild is here for you every step of the way. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out for this Sunday. Make sure to hit the like button before you head out here for the day. Make sure to subscribe if you have not already. And make sure if you haven't, if you would like to uh, join in on additional conversations throughout the week, make sure to join our Discord server. 
we uh, we hang out during games. We hang out during the week. Uh, just dropped the uh, information in the comments. So uh, we look forward to seeing you over there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you for our next video, which will be tomorrow. Uh, Alex Micheletti will join us. A victory, Micheletti, Monday. Maybe the final one of the season. We'll, uh, we'll have to wait and see. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we will see how things go here uh, over the uh, final two games. And uh, more importantly, we got you covered. So make sure to make Lockdown Wild your first listen each and every day, your first choice for Minnesota Wild news and notes. And we'll be back with you for a new episode tomorrow, all part of the Locked On Podcast Network.